Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome everyone. We want to thank you for joining us for our presentation titled Automated Sample Preparation for Biopharmaceutical Analysis, Removing Inefficiencies and Variability. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Kenda Evans, a field application scientist with Agilent Technologies. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit, that, submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address your questions following the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Evans. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction and thank you everyone for attending today. So as they mentioned, I am Kenda Evans. I am a product specialist for the automation division for Agilent. And today we're gonna to be talking about the assay map Bravo and how it can be used for automated sample prep. So going through the agenda for today's talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology. I'm gonna talk about the workbench or the software and some of the different types of applications that can be done on a single platform for the assay map Bravo. Affinity purification, in solution digestion, peptide protein cleanup, phosphopeptide enrichment, on-cartridge enzymatic reactions, and in glycan analysis. So you really get a broad range of different things that can be done throughout an entire workflow, as well as individual little components that can be done on your samples. So what is kind of the workflow that we're kind of discussing here? Well, we have our sample prep in front, and that's the assay map Bravo, and you can see this in the picture that we have on the far left-hand side. And then Agilent has the full continuum. So you can do your sample prep with the assay map Bravo, then your separation and detection with our LCMS products, as well as the data processing with all of our different types of software packages that are available right now. So what exactly is the assay map technology? So this is an actual automated workflow that's designed for analytical chemists. We wanted to make sure that this was something that would be easy to be used by folks that aren't automation um, experts and they don't have to be an automation guru that knows how to program something. That's one of the worst things about getting the automation in the lab is people are scared to use it because the programming language is difficult to learn or it just takes a lot of time. So we've tried to eliminate those obstacles so that you can get in and start using this technology almost immediately. So with the assay map technology, there are several different components. We have microchromatography cartridges, and these are for um, quantitative binding and elution. Basically, we have different flavors of the cartridges, and you'll see this in the list. We have affinity purification, so protein A, protein G, and then streptavidin for your biotinylated um, antibodies or biotinylated proteins. We have reverse phase cleanup using our C18 and RPS. RPS stands for reverse phase small bore cartridges, and the RPW is reverse phase wide bore for doing more of the protein or denatured antibody type of cleanup. We can do fractionation with our strong cation exchange as well as our different reverse phase cartridges. And then phosphopeptide enrichment with titanium dioxide as well as iron NTA. The iron NTA cartridge is an IMAC cartridge, so you're able to cleave off that iron heavy metal and replace it with a different heavy metal if need be to look at different tagged type of um, uh, proteins and peptides. We also can use motif antibodies using our protein A, protein G, or streptavidin. If there's a specific type of antibody raised against, say, phosphopeptide uh, serine 143, and you wanted really to pull out only phosphopeptide serine 143, you would be able to do that if you have a strong antibody that's raised against that. We also now have higher capacity cartridges. We have just released protein A and streptavidin. They have the asterisk beside them. And RPS and C18 are on their way. 
Unfortunately, due to the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, the um, release of the RPS and C-18 has been a bit delayed, but it is coming soon. So that is in the picture at the top. You will see both the different kind of cartridges that we have, our standard five microliter resin, as well as our higher capacity 25 microliter resin. So we also have a specific um, way that we're doing this. And the head, Gas Aim at Bravo, is built just a little bit differently so that it can actually work with these microchromatography cartridges. And it is a positive displacement pipetter. So the syringes inside the head, there's 96 syringes all at once. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those in our next slide but they work directly with the cartridges and enable a precise controlled liquid flow through the cartridges. So you don't have any air bubbles, you don't have any disruption of the binding. So you can control the flow rate. So if you think of the head and the syringes like the pump and the cartridges like your column, you'll see why we're considering this microchromatography type of technology. We also have very simple user interface. It's in a GUI form base. So basically what you need to do is open up the application of interest, then tell it the different parameters, how many um, samples you're gonna be working with. You can do anywhere from one to 96 samples at the same time. And then the volumes that you want to work with. You can also control the flow rates if you need to slow them down or speed them up. And then basically set up the deck the way that it is described in the pictorial and press the green button to say go. It's literally that simple to get up and running with the assay map Bravo. So here's an up close picture of the actual Bravo, assay map Bravo head. You can see that there are 96 syringes. Those are the kind of a beige things that are sticking down from the head in the upper left-hand corner. In the lower left-hand corner, you'll see that we have four columns of cartridges that are loaded onto the four columns of the assay map Bravo head. This is the way of us being able to do different types of numbers of samples at a time. So we recommend doing a full column of cartridges throughout the workflow. But as I mentioned, you can do from one to 96 samples throughout your workflows. The nice thing about using the cartridges as well as the syringes is that you can aspirate up through the cartridge. You can dispense down through the cartridge. You can actually aspirate and dispense using just the syringe or the probe. And then you can also use a, a Bravo pipette tip on the syringe probe to be able to aspirate and dispense as well in some of our liquid handling utilities that we've developed. In the lower right hand corner, you actually see what that syringe looks like. So the kind of beigey part is a very chemical resistant peak plastic with very high quality chemical resistant glass at the top. And then they see the syringe plunger is um, has kind of a Teflon coating at the very end of the plunger and that fits inside the actual syringe. There's one piston inside the head that is, at, that is moving all 96 of the syringes at once. So they're not independently controlled, but because we're able to have the reagents in columns in our reagent plates or have our cartridges in columns on the head, that's a way that we can actually do uh, different numbers other than the full head of 96 all at once. So in the applications that I mentioned, there's a lot of different things that you can do. As I mentioned, antibody purification, amino affinity purification, peptide and protein cleanup, the protein digestion, on cartridge reaction as one of our newer protocols, fractionation, in glycan sample prep, as well as phosphopeptide enrichment. And I'm gonna go through each of these in a little more detail. The large capacity affinity cartridges, as we've just um, released these, I wanna make sure that I, I kind of describe why we thought that these were important as well. 
The original cartridges that we released are five microliter resin bed. And the like for protein A, that has a binding capacity of about 100 micrograms. But if you're doing things such as bioprocessing or things like that, that you really need a lot more binding capacity to enhance for the sample that you're trying to pull out of your solution, you needed a larger binding capacity. So that is why we've created the higher capacity cartridges to allow for that higher um, binding capacity of being able to really get much more out of your sample. You're going to still be able to do your peptide mapping, your peptide quant, your post-translational modifications, as well as look at intact and fragments and functional assays and protein aggregations. Those are just some of the different types of applications that these cartridges and this technology is being used for out in the field. So what else can you use these for? Well, proteomics is another great place for being able to utilize these. Um, using our C18 and our RPS cartridges once they're going to be available to be able to really clean up a large amount of the sample that you're looking at for doing either untargeted proteomics or your targeted proteomics. So there's lots of different things that where you just need larger binding capacity and you just need to get a much higher enrichment. And that's why these um, large capacity cartridges are now so exciting that we can uh, release those out into the field. So now I'm gonna jump into a little bit more of our software, just because I mentioned that you don't have to be an automation engineer to be able to use our software. And I wanted to kind of show you how we have set it up. So we have a little Spark on the desktop of the computer that controls the assay map Bravo. And that brings you to our protein sample workbench. And within the workbench, you have choices of four different options, a workflow library, an application library, utility library, or the literature library. And each one of those would then open up into the different types of libraries that we have in those different um, tabs. So looking at the application library, this is just a sampling of all the different types of applications that are available. We have them all color coded as well as in alphanumeric order. Um, some people really like just to find, oh, I know I'm doing the yellow um, protocol today or I'm doing in solution digestion. So they, they know where to go to look for their application if they wanna do that. As we release new applications, we usually have the older applications that are superseded by the new ones if we've made updates or if we've changed some of the parameters or things like that. And so we have the ones that are about to be obsoleted but just because there are older models in the gray at the end of our application menu, letting you know that you know if you're starting a new project, start off with the newer protocols. And it also gives people time if they've already created SOPs or they've been working with some of our older protocols, they have time to continue to validate and make sure that the newer ones are, haven't changed enough that they're causing any kind of disruption in their workflows. So we allow for that type of um, standardization as well as continuity between protocols. In the utility library, I always like to think of the utility library as things that you would do before or after you're doing your actual chemistry. So utility libraries are going to be things that you're doing like reagent transfers. This is a liquid handler, and we really wanted to make sure that we were able to utilize it for all that it, it could do. And there's so many things that the assay Matt Bravo can actually do. So the utilities allow for creating reagent plates doing serial dilution, doing reformatting or cherry picking if you have some uh, compounds in a plate that you wanna have outside in a different order, you can reformat them. If you wanted to do normalization, so you have your, your actual set of samples and you see that they have their concentrations all over the place. And before you move downstream, before you go into your, say your glycoprep and before you're looking at your glycans, you want to make sure that you have 100 microliters of one mg per mil of your sample that you're going forward in, just to have everything as standardized as possible. 
You can do a normalization with the assay map Bravo, and it's very simple to set up. You basically will tell the assay map Bravo some numbers about what your samples are and then what you want them to be. And it'll go through and uh, sample by sample by sample, pick up a single sample at a time and add the number of, um, of the volume of the sample that you need, as well as the volume of the diluent that you need until you've actually normalized the entire plate of samples that you've requested. So I've actually had some researchers that have wanted to purchase the assay Matt Bravo solely to use the normalization protocol. So they use it for other things, but that was that was a key driver that they really, really were excited about being able to use their normalization protocol. So when you're looking at the application, this is just a actual um, screenshot of our affinity purification application. And they are very harmonized. So you, if once you start working with one, you'll be able to really see how they look with looking at the other ones. This is just the example of affinity purification. We have the ability of actually saving a method. So I can say that this is Kenda's Affinity Purification 2.0 or whatever I want to call my method. And then that's actually going to be in a file folder on the computer that I would be able to load. So I don't have to recreate the same protocol over and over and over again if I'm doing basically the same parameters every single time. So I would actually load my method that I have had saved. I would tell it how many full columns of cartridges I want to be able to use today. And once I click on that load up at the top uh, in the yellow box, it'll actually populate all the numbers that are within the protocol. So it'll have all my um, flow rates, it'll have all my volumes, it'll have all of my wash station uh, parameters as well. Now on the deck of the Bravo, we do have a wash station and that is being flowed. It's a chimney style wash station. So we actually have a DI water or MilliQ water that's going through this, the chimneys in the wash station so that we can constantly clean the probes after we do each one of our additions. So you'll see here in the, in the line of the protocol, we have the, the priming. And at the end, it says wash number. And that's actually the head coming over into the wash station to actually do the washes of the head to make sure that we're not transferring reagents or transferring any type of samples into our next step. We also have a Peltier. So I told you earlier that we could do in-solution digestion. Well, we want to make sure that we keep our um, reagents at a certain temperature. And so we'll be able to use our Peltier in our in-solution digestion, as well as our on-cartridge reaction, as well as our glycoprep glycan protocols. So there's a lot of different things that we have on deck that enable us to do all the different workflows that we've talked about. It's very easy for a bench scientist to be able to pick it up and go um, uh, right into working on the assay map Bravo. The benefits are that very minimal training is needed. I can basically you know, work with the lab and get them up and running and they can be off to the races in the next day or two. We usually have two days of training and people are ready to go. Very rapid implementation. So you can get up and going quickly, already have kind of a, a optimized protocol just by our defaults. And if you're collaborating with other labs outside of your institution, across the state, across the country, across the pond, you'll be able to actually transfer the, the protocols just because everything is harmonized and you'll be able to see exactly what your collaborators are doing as well. So it makes it very simple to work with. This is what people don't like to see. This is under the hood. This is what is VWorks and that's actually driving everything. So this is what we've taken away from having the end users have to work with. Um, and I'm going to get off of this really quick because that scares a lot of people. So I don't want you all to think that you have to look at that. So now I'm actually going to dive into more of the workflows. The first one that I'm going to talk about is affinity purification. And this is using our protein A or our protein G cartridge. And this is very simple. It's bind, wash, elute. 
You can use up to a mil of your samples. We want to make sure that it's particulate free so you don't bind up and clog up the frits that are in the cartridges. And you can do, use up to a full plate or 96 samples can be done. You can actually elute in as small as 10 microliters. So if you're using a mill of your sample and you elute in as little as 10 microliters, you've actually had a hundred fold concentration or an enhancement of your sample. So now you have a highly purified antibody. It's in an aqueous buffer. And then you can take that and put it on downstream um, workflows. So if you needed to take it right from there, you can, do whatever you need to with it. But it's gonna be a very, a very clean system at that point. So this is a little more of the data. This is looking at our smaller capacity, our five microliter bed volume um, binding capacities for these cartridges. And this is actually, if you look at the gray inset on the right hand side, this is actually looking at the very lowest amount that we're binding to our protein A and protein G cartridges using human IgG spiked into Chinese hamster ovary cell culture supernatant. You can see that we have very good recovery and we're able to really have very strong binding at very low levels. So what you're putting in, you're basically getting out. 90% of the loaded mass for every cartridge actually was able to be recovered. So very strong recovery, very tight reproducibility. And this is an example of actually being able to elute everything in a very small amount. So you can see with our protein A and our protein G cartridges, we're actually able to elute close to 98% of all of the um, sample that we put in in less than 10 microliters. So the first two microliters is gonna be kind of the dead volume, and then the rest is gonna be our sample that we're pulling out. With streptavidin, of course, you can use streptavidin cartridges just like you've used streptavidin for any other ways. Make sure that you can have a biotinylated antibody. You could incubate your antibody and your antigen together, or you could have a biotinylated antigen. So. We haven't created anything new. We've just created a new tool to be able to use our biotinylated antibodies and our biotinylated So in solution digestion is another thing that we're able to do on the deck of the assay map Bravo. So you would put in your sample, you would do your denaturant, your reductant, and your alkalant, and then be able to have everything digested. And um, after you've added your protease, and then you can actually do your cleanup to get rid of all the salt so that you actually have a nice sample, clean sample of your peptides that then you're able to put in your LCMS to be able to do your separation and your analysis. So for in-solution digestion, again, it's very straightforward. You can have your particulate-free solutions. We actually have a protocol that will allow you to do digestion on up to four 96 well plates. So if you had the need to digest 384 samples all at once, we have that capability of being able to do it. We've also created a more um, a simplified one plate type of in solution digestion protocol that allows for the addition of up to four reagents into a single sample plate. And so that protocol can really be uh, repurposed, if you will, for many different types of protocols when you needed to add up to four different reagents into the same sample plate and potentially have incubation steps as well. So there's lots of different ways you can utilize our protocols. What you're going to get out of the, of the in-solution digestion is going to be your um, peptides and then that's gonna be ready for your peptide cleanup. So in doing the peptide cleanup, you're gonna be able to have either the C18, which is a silica-based, or our RPS, as I mentioned, that's a small bore um, polymeric type of reverse phase cartridge. 
Again, it's bind, wash, elute. You, hopefully you see a pattern. You want the particulate free type of solution to be used with here. You can use up to a mil of your sample and you can work with up to 96 samples at a time. You can still get up to that 100 fold concentration factor because again, we can elute in as small as 10 microliters off of our small capacity card. So in peptide cleanup, it should look very similar to what I showed you previously with the um, affinity purification type of protocol. So this allows you to choose all of, this one already has all the numbers, the default numbers in it. So you actually have the ability to conduct a step with a check mark that's in this first column. And then you change volumes as needed. You change the flow rates as needed. And then the number of times it's going to go into the wash station. You have the ability to choose from, from pre-configured types of labware that we recommend and that we've already defined. And then as long as you put it, everything on the deck, as we have defined in the pictorial for the deck layout, all you need to do is come over and hit the green button at the top on the right hand side that says run peptide cleanup. And you'll be able to come back in about 45 to 50 minutes if you're using our five microliter um, reverse phase cartridges and be able and some of the default settings that we have here and you would be able to have your clean salt free peptides ready to go on for analysis. This is just some of the data. This is looking at BSA. What we did was BSA digestion and then also cleanup. One day we worked with it using urea as our denaturant. The other day we used guanidine and we also cleaned it up with either C18 or with RPS. So a lot of folks ask us, well, which one is the better one to use? And we, in this app note, we really showed that they're very, very comparable between the RPS and the C18 and using either urea or guanidine for your denature. As you can see that the percent CVs are very, very low for the five um, peptides that we have listed here. And in the table down below, you can see how many different samples that we were testing and how many we monitored and also the types of percent CVs that were less than 5%, that were in between five and 10% and that was greater than 10%. So very, very tight CVs that were getting very reproducible and very clean data comparing the difference between RPS and C18 for the cleanup. Another example of that is when we were working with a, a MAB looking at quantitation. These peaks are actually 12 different samples that are actually lined up on top of each other. So we actually have a very good reproducibility. Again, you see the different peptides and their percent CV. So all of this was less than 8% percent CV. That's the highest one that we have in this table. But again, this goes to show the different types of um, reduction in your variability and the increase in your recovery rates that we're able to show with this technology. So with this, you can actually do, as I've shown already, many different things. You can go with your complete workflow. If you have an antibody from the very start, you can purify it. Then you're going to have your purified antibody. You can digest it, you can clean, clean it up, so it's now gonna be salt-free peptides, and then you can be able to use that on the LCMS to really see very quality data as you're um, using your high-sensitive LCMS. You wanna make sure that you're only looking at the, a clean sample. You don't wanna be analyzing things that you don't, you don't care about. So the more enhancement that you can do and the cleaner the sample, the better the results at the other end. Looking at it as in another way, it's also great for doing different types of um, identification. If you want to really look at peptide mapping and you want to use different types of proteases, you can do that all in the same run. So you don't have the variability of when I did it this time, I used trypsin. When I did it this time, I used glue C. Hopefully that looks all the same and I did everything exactly the same each time. 
you can actually put the different uh, proteases in a column in our reagent plates and run the same samples at the same time through the entire protocol. And then you would be able to see what it looks like if you have all those different types of peptide mappings. And an example of that is here, when I, we're actually looking at the different types of amino acid coverage that we were able to get if we had trypsin, chemotrypsin, or GLU-C, you can see for the light chain, we had basically 100% of our amino acid coverage. And for the heavy chain, we had 99%. So we're really able to map out uh, the MAB very, very uniquely. So if you also wanted to do rapid antibody digestion, because one of the biggest things about your digestion protocol is that the denaturant in the in-solution digestion slows down your protease. So there's a lot of new proteases that are quick acting and high temperature and everything like that, but you want to still make sure that the denaturant that you have in your solution is as low as possible so that protease has as much oomph as possible. So we have the ability of actually using protein cleanup using our reverse phase wide bore cartridges or our RPW cartridges to be able to remove the denaturant after we've done our denaturant reductin and alkylation. We'll um, clean up everything, get rid of that denaturant, and then we're able to add our protease to be able to really speed up that digestion. And this allows us to, in this case, this application note, we had a, a protease or a trypsin digestion of only two hours, and we were able to still get really great data in looking at our peptide mapping or doing quantification or post-translational modifications. And this is just some of that data that we had. The first thing that we looked at is our dynamic binding capacity. With that, because we're working with proteins here, so it's the dynamic binding capacity is gonna be a little bit different than if we were working with peptides. But we were able to show with our RPW cartridges that we start seeing the breakthrough of the eluate about uh, 75 micrograms. So that's what we consider as our dynamic binding capacity. We're still able to elute off basically 98% of everything that we've put in within 10 microliters if we're using our five microliter bed cartridges. And then this is just looking at over a series of different samples, the reproducibility at the different at the different um, load amount. So 10 micrograms, 25, 50, and 75. You see that we're really able to, well, in fact, we've made mass because our percent recovery is actually over 100, but we're actually able to recover up to 100%, and we're actually able to have very, very tight CVs. So excellent recovery as well as very tight data and reproducibility. Now, if we're working with phosphopeptide enrichment, again, we're going to be using bind, wash, and elute. This is just an example of us being able to use our iron NTA or our IMAC cartridges to pull out our specific phosphopeptide um, to do phosphopeptide enrichment. The phosphopeptide enrichment is there's some folks or some phosphopeptides that really respond well to iron NTA or IMAC type cartridges. And there's some phosphopeptides and some phosphopeptide researchers that really like titanium dioxide. So we have both options because we want to make sure that you're able to get the most of your phosphopeptides out of your system and be able to use those in your downstream reagent or downstream analysis. This is looking at alpha casein. Alpha casein is just a really good, highly phosphorylated type of um, reagent that's good to use as a model system. So what we've done is we've shown the sample input of what we're um, kind of putting in there. And then we also have our cartridge eluate, so what we're actually pulling out. And then our, our excuse me, our flow through, which is anything that didn't bind to our phosphopeptide enriching cartridge. And then we actually have our specific phosphopeptides that we're able to pull out. And in here, you can see the little peaks that we have. And then the asterisks that are above are whether that was a singly 
phosphorylated, a double phosphorylated, or even a triple phosphorylated peptide. And we're able to have a lot of those pulled out of the sample and be able to have very good identification of all of those different types of phosphopeptides from the case alpha casein sample. Now, phosphopeptide enrichment, as I mentioned, it's still that bind, wash, and elute. So if you're using the iron NTA, if you're using the titanium dioxide, or as I mentioned originally in the beginning of the, of the presentation, you can use motif antibodies. And CST has actually um, had a paper on this previously about using specific motif antibodies to really enhance that enrichment even greater than just kind of the generic phosphopeptide enrichment that you would get with titanium dioxide or with iron NTA. So another way of being able to use the assay map Bravo is to look at kind of accurate mass. And we're doing that with our on cartridge reaction protocols. So what we would do is we would immobilize our, in this case, a bioaccumulated antigen. And then we would enrich for the MAB that actually bound to that antigen. So now we have our antigen and we have our antibody that is kind of immobilized onto our cartridges. If we don't use any enzyme at all and we elute, we could actually get off the intact MAB or have, if we're having under reduction conditions, we could have the heavy chain and the light chain. Another way of being able to utilize this tool and look at things is if you're using on cartridge deglycosylation. So if we actually use a, um, the a deglycosylator and be able to use pro, uh, the, uh, geez, I just went blank on the name of it. Anyway, <laughs> if we're cleaving off all of our glycans, we would be able to collect all of those in our flow through and then be able to use the instant PC kit or our Prozyme kits and be able to look at all the glycans that we've cleaved off. And then we can also have our deglycosylated intact MAB, or again, if it's under reducing conditions, we would have our deglycosylated heavy chain and light chain. Another way of being able to utilize this is if we're actually going to break up the MAB, say we want to use IDES or a fabricator, we can actually cleave the antibody at the hinge region and be able to have just the FC portion that would come off after the enzymatic reaction of the IDES and then be able to elute off either the um, FAB section or the FD in the light chain section of the MAB. So another way of really being able to look at the different components of your antibody if needed. This enables quite a few different workflows. So being able to look at drug to antibody ratio or antibody drug conjugates, looking at intact protein accurate mass with um, the glycans or without, looking at different post-translational modifications, as well as doing glycan profiling and identification. So lots of different ways of being able to use the on-cartridge reaction to be able to enable for more information about your sample. We also have our, our Prozyme folks that are now part of Agilent, which we're really excited about. We can actually have the glycoprep protocols that um, Prozyme created they're made specifically for the assay map, and these are already programmed into the assay map Bravo. So when you are originally doing glycans, and I know it's very tedious if you're doing this by hand, to have to use the microfuse tubes and centrifuge and everything, it takes about four to five hours to do about 24. And so that's with a really good um, person in the lab that's very conscientious. But we all know that when you're doing things manually, there's always that person that walks in the lab and asks that question right as you're about to add some crucial reagent. So it could always take, um, reduce the amount of samples just because you want to make sure that you don't get your, your carpal tunnel and your fatigue and you don't make those mistakes. You can also do it in a plate-based format. If you do it in the plate-based format, it's still going to be being done manually. You have to... Um, 
watch it as you're doing it. You, so you can be there for the next step to add the next set of reagents. And you're still being having to use a centrifuge. So it takes a little bit more time or it takes about four to five hours, but it takes your time because you have to be there. In the automated workflow, you can do up to 96 wells, 96 samples. It's going to be in a, a microplate, but you're using it on the assay map Bravo. The Bravo is going to be able to work all, through all the different protocols on its own. You don't have to sit there with it. It can do all the work as needed um, unattended. So it really frees you up to be able to do more work outside of babysitting the protocols. But you're actually going to be able to purify your antibody. You would be able to denature and immobilize. And then you would digest with N-glycanase. You would take off your fluorescent label. You would label it, clean it up, and be able to elude it so that then you'll be able to have your reading to go forward. So with the glycoprep, there are several different options. You can use instant AB, instant PC, 2AB, or APTS. And we have each of these available um, in the glycoprep protocols that are on the assay map Bravo. The nice thing about it is part of the workflow that we have, this is an example of one of the glycoprep protocols, but we actually have it as kind of combined into a nice little uh, workflow um, GUI interface. So you could do your affinity purification, you could do your normalization, and then you could choose which glycan label you would like to use. You see the different ones that are listed there. And we also have all those utilities that you might need to use before or after. But in one GUI interface with the user, you're able to click on everything that you would need to do to do your full glycoprep type of protocol. So hopefully, I've been able to convey to you today that the SAMAP Bravo will provide great reproducibility for your entire workflow. Um, many times, multiple steps in a workflow, the, the variability just increases and it's compounded throughout the entire workflow. We've been able to show that that is not the case with assay map Bravo because everything is so tight and we're able to have very tight reproducibility throughout the entire workflow, even though there can be multiple steps. You can reduce the number of replicates, so you can really increase the throughput that you can get through your samples. You can increase your walk away time so you can have more time to do more. There's never enough time in the day. And I know that there's a lot of folks that need to be writing grants. They need to be analyzing data. They need to be preparing for their next project. There's so many more things that you need to be doing than just holding a handheld pipetter in your hand and adding reagents. The assay map Bravo will allow for you to do that and so much more just based on the uh, wide range of applications that are available. Very easy to use software. So you able to look at it and be able just to add a few parameters and be able to click the green button that tells it to go. It's really designed for non-automation experts. So you don't have to be an automation engineer to know how to program it or how to make changes in the programs. Everything is already prepared. You just have to fill in a few numbers. Minimal training, simple person-to-person -person or site-to-site -site transfers. And it is a single platform for various sample prep needs. It's definitely not a one-trick pony. You can do many, many different things with the assay map, Bravo. Just a little um, a, a fun story I want to kind of leave you with. I, I know that listening to someone say, oh, it's, it's so easy to use. It's so easy to use. A real live example is I was working with some researchers in a lab doing a demo with them. And we spent the first day me running the ship, if you will, and really teaching them how to use the, the instrument. The next day they came in and said, Kenda, I really want to be able to run it myself. And I said, great. I let them have control. I just stepped back. If they had questions, of course, I answered them. The third day that I was with them in the lab, they were bringing people from down the hall and showing them how to use the instrument. So it really is that easy to be able to use and be able to get great results, reproducible results, and reduce your variability. 
So that is what I wanted to share with you guys today about the assay map Bravo, how it's absolutely a scalable sample prep, and you're going to be able to get very good precision for your proteomics as well as your biopharmaceutical analysis. Thank you, and I will now address any questions if we have any. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Evans, for that outstanding presentation. We will now move into the live Q&A portion of the presentation. Uh, on the left of your screen, you will see a Q&A box. Please feel free to submit your questions through there for Dr. Evans to answer for you. So let's go ahead, and it looks like we do have one question in here so far. Uh, Dr. Evans, have there been any peer-reviewed publications regarding the assay map Bravo? And if so, what journals were they in? That's a great question. Um, in fact, we have been doing a tally of some of our um, journal articles just recently so that we have a nice compendium. We have over 100, and I think the latest count was 103 peer-reviewed articles that have been written by um, our researchers in different journal articles. Most recently, they have been published in Cell, Nature, and Science. So we've in, you know, not too shabby type of uh, journals, but also the Journal of Proteomics, uh, Cell, Nature, lots of different types of journal articles have been recently published using the assay map and actually using the assay map Bravo for different techniques that we hadn't even imagined yet. So it's great to see the imagination of our researchers and how they're utilizing this tool to really get at those questions they haven't been able to answer before in their labs. Wonderful. So let's give the audience just a couple more seconds to see if you have any other questions. Um, your presentation was so informative, it answered everyone's questions, Dr. Evans. Um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go ahead and, and end with this. So thank you again, Dr. Evans, and thank you to the audience um, for the question. Again, it was such an informative presentation. Nobody had any. Um, we hope you found today's presentation to be informative and insightful. Um, to our audience, this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. Don't miss out on the other valuable presentations on our agenda. Uh, please visit the event presentation schedule in the auditorium. Thank you again, everyone, for your participation. Stay healthy, and until next time, bye-bye. Thank you.